Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Port Phillip City Council. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the Yalakut Willem clan of the Boomerang. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present, and we acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. I remind the gallery that the Council's meeting, local law requires that members of the gallery must not interject in the meeting. Any person who is called to order may be requested to leave the chamber. If you wish to ask a question or speak to a report, please complete the blue form that's available at the table just outside the chamber and hand it to a staff member. If you've registered to speak online, you must let a staff member know that you have arrived. I encourage you to limit your questions and comments to three minutes and to avoid repeating any points that have already been made by other speakers. And please note that all council meetings are live streamed to allow the community to watch and to listen in real time. In accordance with Council's local law, this meeting cannot be separately filmed or audio taped unless permission is granted by the Mayor. And in the unlikely event of an emergency evacuation, please follow the instructions of the emergency warden. It is the role of a councillor to participate in decision making of the Council. And in performing their role, councillors are bound by their code of conduct and must treat all persons with respect and have due regard to the opinions, beliefs, rights and responsibilities of other councillors, council staff and other persons. It's a requirement of the Local Government Act that councillors must support and promote the councillor conduct principles by leadership and example and act in a way that secures and preserves public confidence in the office of the councillor. This includes councillors' compliance with meeting procedure, local laws. Instead, instances in which the Mayor requests compliance with the local law will be included in the minutes of the meeting. So we'll go to the agenda now, councillors. Item one is apologies, and we have everyone in attendance today, so there are no apologies. Item two, which is the minutes of the previous meeting, they were held on the 5th of February 2020 and have been circulated. Are there any questions relating to the minutes? I note there are none. So can I have a motion, please? Councillor Simic to move, Councillor Brand to second. I will now put that motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Item three, which is declarations of conflicts of interest. Does any councillor have a conflict of interest in any matters that are being discussed tonight. I note there are none. Four petitions and joint letters and councillors we have no petitions or joint letters on tonight's agenda. Five is a sealing schedule and councillors we don't have any documents that require sealing. So the next is before we go to six public question time we've got an a couple of awards. So the presentation of an award has been added to tonight's agenda and I'm going to ask the CEO to advise. Uh, thank you Madam Mayor and through you I'm happy to advise that at the recent LG Pro Excellence Awards which are awards held across all local governments in Victoria held on the 20th of February 2020 uh, City of Port Phillip Council is recognised by winning awards in two categories. I'd ask the General Manager, City Strategy and Sustainable Development, Lily Rosich, and General Manager, Menchie and Infrastructure, Lachlan Johnson, to say a few words and present these two awards to the Mayor. Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, in partnership with the cities of Whittlesea and Wyndham, the City of Port Phillip won the LG Pro Sustainability Award for developing and piloting the Supply Chain Sustainability Schools website to support businesses to improve their own sustainability. Congratulations to all the teams involved in this excellent project. Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, I'm delighted to advise that the City of Port Phillip was recognised in the category of Innovative Management for its Earn Value Project Management Initiative. Earn Value Management is a project controls technique that provides a real-time snapshot of the health of a project. This initiative is helping Council deliver projects for the community on time and within budget. Congratulations to all involved.
Well done. Thank you very much for those, those awards. Now we'll go to item six, which is uh, public question time. And councillors, we have three people that have requested to speak to this item. I'll call them up in the order they, they are here. First of all, David Burst, Burstner, please. Have you arrived yet? No. Josh Zentinel. Hello, Josh. Please come forward um, to the seat at the front there. Uh, pop your microphone on. And if you would say, state your name yep. again and your suburb. <clears throat> yeah, sure. So uh, Josh Zentinel, East St Kilda. Um, so uh, I wanted to speak about the uh, Income and Road Safe Cycling Corridor Pilots. So. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of ratepayers of Port Phillip, but also on behalf of myself, because I live on Inkerman Street. Um, we got a letter a week or two ago from Port Phillip saying that Glen Iris Council is progressing with the corridor pilot project and that the City of Port Phillip is working with Glen Iris, um Council to uh, work out what's going to happen with the cycling project. Um, I had a uh, number of concerns and questions for Council about this. So the Glenara um, proposal, uh, which has been going for a while, they've now got a community reference group and they're floating some uh, interesting ideas for income and streets, such as a 30 kilometre an hour speed limit, um, uh, road closures uh, of all the side streets and potentially making income and street a one-way street. Um, I've got a number of questions. Firstly, is there a deal between Port Phillip and Glen Ira on this project about what's going to happen? Because I haven't heard anything about it um, in terms of uh, Glen Ira's got their process, but is there a process for Port Phillip? Um, will there be a community reference group for Port Phillip? Um, has this already been voted on? I couldn't find anything, but I'm not sure whether this has already come to council and been voted on. And um, does Port Phillip have a timeline or is it basically just going to copy whatever Glen Iris says? Because there are different considerations, I think. Is that the end of your questions then? That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms Rosick, are you able to address those questions? Through you, Madam Mayor, uh, the City of Port Phillip has identified the income and bike corridor in its Move, Connect, Live strategy. Um, at this stage, we're at the early um, stages of um, planning for that corridor. The city of Glen Ira is, a, is more progressed and they're consulting with the community on the proposed corridor. We are working in partnership with them to ensure that there's alignment of the corridor down St Kilda Street and St Kilda Road through the two um, municipalities. Um, we, so we're not at a point where we've um, considered the, any community reference group. We are at the planning stage and we will report back to council in regards to the community engagement approach and also um, timelines for the project delivery. Um, but we, are, we have notified um, affected residents of Glen Ira's consultation process by correspondence. And any other questions I'll take on notice. Thank you, Ms Rosick. I think the key piece of information there, if you look at the Move, Live and Connect strategy, you'll be able to see all the um, bike paths that we are planning over the next 10 years in the city of Port Phillip. Thank you, Mr Sintel. Uh, Mr William Cross, please. That's me. That's you. If you could come forward, Mr Cross. Great. Well, welcome to you. If you would have a seat and turn on that microphone. Thank you. Pop on the microphone, please. Yep. The button. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Please state your name and your suburb. Pardon? What is your name? William Cross. And your suburb? 20 Greaves Street, St Kilda. Thank you. Mr Cross, please uh, address the councillors. Well, I, I, I've always been pondering why, when I go to... A, where, does, where does Port Phillip stop and Caulfield stop, start? Okay. East St Kilda. Mm -hmm. 
Why do my street, which I've been there for 20 years, has got rubbish bins all thrown around after being picked up, and I've got to pick them all up and put them around and tidy them up. When I go across the road, all, this, all the rubbish bins are, are, are in Caulfield Council, are all stacked empty, but stacked up neatly. Correct? And do you have any further questions? No, yes, I do. Okay, can you please... How come... Oh, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to ask personal questions, but how come St Kilda Council... I've been paying rates for 50, year, well, 50 years. How come councils spend so much money and put pictures on walls when all the graffiti experts who are friends come and, 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 and stuff them up so then, they, then, they, then, they, then they come around and fix them up and get paid again by the council. So you're paying, you're paying them to put pictures up. You pay, and, and they're gonna. Then they destroy them, and then they come up and do it again. That's all I've got to say. Okay. So that last question is that uh, uh, we Any, put street art. Got yeah. problems with that? No, not at all. Thank you for your questions. They're very good. You realise you're talking to a Vietnam vet. Thank you. And if you could, I might go for your job next year. Great. We always need lots of more people ah. to run for council. <laughs> nice meeting you, ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cross. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Take a seat. Um, we'll be able to answer those, Mr. Johnson. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, I'll have to take the question on notice about the rubbish bins. Um, we will get back to Mr Cross and let him know what's going on there. This is feedback that we do occasionally receive, so we can take that up with our contractor. Um, with regards to graffiti and murals, so Council's graffiti management plan endorses the painting of murals to try and um, discourage uh, graffiti in some areas. It has been highly successful across the municipality, but I'm happy to look at any specific areas where, for example, murals are being um, uh, being graffitied over after being undertaken. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. William Sylvester, please. Welcome, Mr. Sylvester. Just pop the microphone on, please, and state your name again and suburb. William Sylvester Balaclava. Um, my questions are addressed to the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor with regard to a follow-up from the... Um, do you mind if I just close the door? I'm having... The right, door needs the door? to remain open while we sit. OK. It's a lo local law. Um, I'll try and concentrate. We could give you a minute if that would be... Yeah, it is distracting. I think he's heading off. Um, so my questions are to the Mayor and Deputy Mayor with regard to uh, a follow-up from the Planning Committee meeting last week in relation to the development at 21 to 23 William Street, Balaclava. Um, one of our ob fellow objectors received a letter today from a Lily Rosick with regard to the prospect of a design and development overlay being conducted on the industrial precinct. Um, having read through the um, previous Carlisle Street Urban Design Framework dated November 2009 and seen that there was an indication there that the industrial precinct um, urban design should be reviewed within the next 10 years and we're now more than 10 years down the track. Um, Lily indicated that there was no indication, in fact um, it reads that there's a refusal to conduct a design and development overlay um, on this area. We believe it should be conducted given that not only is there a prospect for a VCAT decision to approve an eight full story development in an area where the previous urban design framework suggested there should only be five storeys or at the most seven storeys, and given that um, Red Scooter and several other properties are now up for sale just in the last few weeks, and we understand that another property, Golds, is due to be going up for sale, 
clearly there is a rapid um, level of interest um, of developers to to um, to uh, grow this area and probably to try and have equally high developments. Um, we are very keen to see uh, a DDO being conducted in this area to particularly restrict height and we'd like to um, ask uh, the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor whether this is going to be considered and what we as um, William Street and other residents uh, can do to assist in this matter. Thank you, Mr Sylvester. Um, the councillors haven't seen that letter, so I'll ask uh, Ms Rosek to respond and explain um, to all of us, uh, I guess, what the content of that letter is. And councillors may take up further questioning uh, in, in our councillor question time um, to address it further. Thank you. And just before you ask her that, yes, um, I've had a look at the planning committee meeting minutes from last week and any questions or comments being made from the public were summarised in one line. So the reason why I'm making that comment is do I need to meet, make rapid notes based on what Lily says or will I be able to obtain the minutes all of our meetings, meeting later? All of our meetings are live streamed <coughs> and recorded and so you can actually go back and listen or, 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 or view those. Okay. Um, but the minutes are short, yes, the comments. Are Thank minutes. you. Ms Rosick, are you able to address that? Through you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, I provided um, a response to Mr Bursner today in regards to the design and development overlay for William Street and outlined that um, the current planning controls, in summary, I won't read the letter, but in summary, the um, current planning controls were considered ad adequate. Um, for the decision made last week by Council's planning committee. Um, there, there is a structure plan, a Carlisle Street Activity Centre structure plan, which did indicate that um, a provision for reviewing controls and a DDO. Um, given that there was minimal development in the past decade, it was not considered a priority over other pieces of work that were required in terms of planning amendments and considerations. However, having said that, the precinct structure plans and urban design frameworks for Carlisle Street and other activity centres in St Kilda have been identified in the council plan and we're reviewing the prioritisation of completion of these structure plans um, for the coming um, financial year and that will be considered as part of, a part of council's annual budget. We have identified it as an important piece of work now because um, the number of planning uh, applications has increased and we recognise that it is timely to review the zoning of that area and the development, uh, design and development overlay um, to make sure that we have appropriate development for that site. So it is a piece of work that is identified in the council plan, is now um, prioritised for consideration. Uh, these pieces of work, I must um, outline, can take two to three years to complete and the outcome um, of the, uh, the planning controls may actually allow for greater heights um, now, um, given that the population is increasing and the land use is changing. So um, the outcome, I don't know what it will be, but uh, at, it may actually result in greater heights being permitted in that area. At the moment, there are, no, there are only discretionary heights, there are no controls that uh, indicated um, a specific height. And as I said, the considerations last week were in accordance with the planning controls and um, uh, uh, an informed council decision. And all of that is outlined concisely, I think, in the letter provided to Mr Bursner. And I'm more than happy to meet with him and provide further information as required. Thank you, Ms Rosick. Can I just clarify you, Mr Sylvester? I am. Okay, so we, William Sylvester, right? Yep, so yep. when Lily says meet with him, is she referring to me or David Burstner? Sorry. Or both? Through you, Madam Mayor, sorry to clarify. I'm happy to meet with you too. Sorry, Thank I you. didn't catch your name at the beginning. I recognise you from the planning committee meeting and I think I got yep. the names mixed up, so Bill. terribly sorry. <laughs> Great, we've got that sorted out, that's good. Thank you very much um, for that, Mr Sylvester. Um, uh, so am I able to, because my initial question was addressed to the Mayor and Deputy Mayor? Um, to Dick Gross and um, Tim Baxter. I'm 
Or are they taking it as a, on notice? Is that it? Or? We will take that on notice. I'm the mayor, Mr. Sylvester, and oh, Councillor apologies. Baxter is the, is the um, deputy. Oh, sorry. Um, that's okay. I'm behind the times, obviously. My fellow, <laughs> yes, um, Councillor Gross was the mayor last year. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. We'll, we'll take oh, that, okay. that up right. in the next session. Thank you. That's the. And is Mr. David Burstner here yet? Uh, not Madam here. Mayor, I, we, we did receive a communication. I believe he's not able to make it, but I, I can't speak on his behalf. But that wasn't an email that I got. Okay. Early. Thanks he, for clarifying that. He up. indicated to me he wasn't oh. in bed to get here. Thank you. Great. Very good. All right, now that's the end of public question time. Councillors, um, we'll now move into councillor question time. Are there any questions? Councillor Brand. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on uh, the 4th of December at the, council, at the ordinary council meeting in 2019, um, we uh, passed an um, emergent diversion business uh, which read um, that council meet with appropriate ministers, including the Minister of Tour for Tourism, to commend the work of the Bring Back Brooks Jetty Group and to seek funds from the Victorian Government to contribute to the enhancement of the Melbourne Water Shakespeare Grove drain project and ask that Melbourne Water consider the winning, winning designs of the Leighton Prize in the development of options for rebuilding the Shakespeare Grove drain. And I just want to ask um, what progress has been made and how that's gone since that motion was passed. Ms Rosich. Through you, Madam Mayor, um, I'm happy to advise that uh, council officers from the city design team have met with Melbourne Water and confirmed in an options workshop held on the 17th of December uh, last year with Bring Back Brooks Jetty representation and other officers that they will consider the winning designs of the Leighton Prize in the development of options for rebuilding the Shakespeare Grove drain. Uh, just of note, the Leighton Prize was awarded from 108 entries to the Portuguese duo JJS Architect last Friday night, the 28th. Oh, this is the 28th. Um, officers have been working to arrange meetings with ministers, and this advocacy point will be raised at those meetings. Thank you. I can also add to that um, that on the agenda on many of the ministers' lists that I've got. It is one of the, one of the points um, that I'll be making, Councillor Brand. Any other questions, councillors? Councillor Pearl? Thanks, Mayor. I was just wondering if uh, council officers could give an update on what precautions uh, council is taking regarding to coronavirus. Uh, obviously, it's a state government uh, issue in terms of general protection of the community. But in terms of our child care facilities and protection of staff, uh, what measures have been enacted, if any, um, and communications provided to staff around what they should do and shouldn't do uh, in the event that the situation um, increases over the coming weeks? Good question, Councillor Pearl. It was the subject of our briefings today. Mr Johnson, please. Oh, Mr Johnson. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I, I'll answer the first part of the question, then I'll pass over to Mr Kiernan to answer the second part. Um, as Councillor Pearl uh, pointed out, the uh, majority of um, responsibility for dealing with such an event uh, sits with the state and federal governments, but uh, the City of Port Phillip as a local government area uh, provides support through our emergency management planning. Uh, Council has an emergency planning committee that meets regularly that, uh, to deal with um, issues such as uh, the potential of a coronavirus pandemic. Uh, that meeting um, looks at all of Council's different services that are provided, including childcare services and other um, amenity and other direct services to the community. I'll hand over to Mr Keenan to elaborate on what, um, what has been happening with our childcare centres. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Through you, Mayor. Um, in relation to the children's services, uh, we're keeping the staff and parents up to date with... We've got two sources, Department of Human Ser Health and Human Services, obviously, but also Department of Education. I uh, would note that in the event of an extreme pandemic response, children's services 
can be ordered to be closed, but we hopefully hope we won't get there, that we're a long way off from that. And we're reinforcing the usual um, universal precautions in terms of hand washing, etc. We have had two families in voluntary quarantine, not families had current services, but they were due to enrol. They hadn't started and they're in voluntary quarantine at home. Uh, and um, the other thing is that it appears from what we... that the virus doesn't have a significantly negative impact on children, but they carry it. So in terms of children getting sick, it doesn't appear that children suffer very badly if they have the virus, but they are very effective carriers of the virus, is what we understand. Just a quick follow-up, if I could, Mayor. Um, Mr CEO, if you could... Oh, sorry. So I just may add to that, and that may help with the follow-up or not. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, I've been sending communications out last week. Um, the Municipal Emergency Man Management Plan has a sub-plan specifically aimed at managing pandemics, which was reviewed, I believe, in August 19. Um, that plan relies on, uh, has got two states of alert uh, from the Victorian Health Authorities. The first is a standby alert, um, which starts to trigger a whole range of actions. And the second is an action alert when once we get to a, a state of pandemic. Um, we haven't received that standby alert yet. Notwithstanding that, we are uh, doing internal preparations in terms of uh, planning, uh, making sure we've got necessary supplies and those sorts of things in place and um, standing up the committee which will look at the implementation of that standby, standby status and action plan if we're asked to do so by the Victorian Health Authorities and I intend to keep communication uh, going through to staff over the coming weeks. Councillor Perry. Very comprehensive. I was just wondering if Council did need to meet under a situation such as that and we couldn't physically get together, uh, what would we actually do if a decision had to be made uh, if we can't meet physically in the same place under the local law? Uh, three, three, Madam Mayor, I have to take that on notice. I don't think that's in our plan, but I think there would be arrangements put in place um, where uh, we could seek uh, relevant governance and decision-making arrangements in a safe way. But I'm happy to, to take that on further for you. Thank you for the question. Any further questions, councillors? Okay, there are none. So we'll move on with the agenda, um, which is presentations of reports. Um, so first up we have item 8.1, which is the presentation of the CEO report, issue number 63. We don't have anyone that's requested to speak. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? I might kick off. Um, in the report, it talks about a new booking portal for hard waste bookings. I'm just wondering if someone could um, outline exactly what that is, please. Mr Johnson. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, the changes that are outlined in the, or referred to in the CEO report, uh, we made some, there's an online portal that people can book uh, for hard waste pickups. Um, we made some of the questions that were um, uh, discretionary. We made them mandatory to help with collecting better information from the community. So one of those questions was about whether the dump rubbish includes a mattress. Uh, one of the other questions was a bit more information about where the hard rubbish is actually placed. So that information helps us target our service better. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Um, another question is around the Shrine to Sea or the Kerford Road uh, works, actually. Um, it mentions a work plan being put together. I'm just wondering if you could outline what that work plan is and if councillors will have an opportunity to um, review that work plan. <coughs> Through you, Madam Mayor, council officers have commenced work with the Depart DELP, Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning on the Shrine to Sea project, which forms part of Kerford Road is included in that. Um, at this stage, it's an internal working document where we're, there's an internal work plan 
and um, an internal communication and engagement plan. I am actually attending a meeting on Friday in regards to that as part of the uh, member of the project control group and um, we intend to provide that information to councillors shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Rosick. Um, streets cleaned. Um, there's a new metric in the report um, saying 91% of the streets are cleaned each month now, so congratulations. I just wanted to understand, one, how you know that it's 91%, and two, um, what happens with the streets that have cars parked? along them? Are they considered cleaned? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. So in terms of how we collect that data, um, monitoring and collecting that data is a vital part of our service delivery. Uh, so we take that very seriously. So we do that in two ways. First of all, uh, streets are randomly audited to see the quality of street sweeping that's been occurring. And we also use our GPS and telematics, telematics uh, that are in the street sweepers to help clarify which streets have been swept. With regards to uh, streets that have cars parked in them, so where possible the street sweepers and blowers will work around cars where it's safe to do so uh, and there's not going to be any damage to vehicles. So that's where you've got a street sweeper coming down the road and you've got staff on either side that blow material from the nature strip and from the curb and gutter into the middle of the road. Um, where that cannot be done, uh, sometimes we have staff use brooms. Uh, we try and avoid that if possible. If a street can't be swept because it's actually um, too densely populated with parked cars, it's recorded and then we come back there uh, later on in the week to actually try and do that at a different time. Thank you. And one last one from me. Um, since we're at the South Melbourne Town Hall, I noticed the ramp at the, the side here is um, currently being built, um, but it's the second time it's been built over the last few months. I'm just wondering if someone could outline uh, what's happened with the ramp. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I'm unaware as to whether the works have been done previously, but the works have been taking a while. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that the works will be finished this Friday, all going well, if it doesn't rain too much tonight. Um, and the ramp will then be open for use over the weekend. Um, the ramp was identified for replacement as part of the upgrade of the lifts within this building. When that was undertaken as part of the building permit for those works, the ramp was identified as being non-compliant and needing to be upgraded after that point. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, we have an officer's recommendation to uh, accept the report. Um, do I have a, a mover for that? Councillor um, Baxter to move, Councillor Crawford to second. Councillor Baxter, would you like to speak to re the report? Uh, yes, I will. So uh, once again, um, a very uh, informative report, and I'm hoping that uh, that our residents are reading this to get a good idea of, uh, of what's going on. And, I find it quite useful um, and uh, yeah, it's very uh, approachable and accessible. So good job once again. Thank you. Councillor Crawford, no, you don't want to speak. Would anyone else like to speak to this report? Then I'll now put that motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Now we'll move to item 9.1, which is JL Murphy Pavilion funding request. And we have one person that's requested to speak to this item. Mr. Darren Williams, please. Welcome. Just pop on that microphone there. And if you could state your name and suburb, please. Uh, Darren Williams, Port Melbourne. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> A little time ago, we made this um, recommendation to the CEO, Peter Smith, to um, request for further funding of uh, Jail Murphy Pavilion Development, which is just about finished. Um, the funding consists of uh, all, all up at $77,000, just on $77,000, and it helps the clubs to facilitate kitchen, cool room expenditure and... Um, a little bit more furniture to keep the, um, you know, the, pe the people that are, you know, the capacity that we believe is about 200 people. 
from the reports. Um, we would like to get that up a little bit more closer to 150 seats and then also some additional televisions, etc. So come opening time on the 22nd, considering there's been $4.7 million allocated to the project, that we would like to see the um, facility in full swing and operational. Thank you, Mr Williams. Councillor Pearl, you've got a question for Mr Williams. If I could, just tell me the community benefit more broadly, other than including your clubs, but more broadly than your club of um, where this money is going to go. Uh, well, there's, there's, five, there's five clubs involved. Um, with the five clubs, there's in excess of close to, in, or over a thousand people, probably close to 800 kids involved. On during um, weekdays, there's food and beverage able to be served to the kids, um, and then additionally to that, on the weekends, that patrons can obviously. Um, enjoy food and bev as well. The important thing then is from looking at it outside of that is that the council obviously has the right to use the space and can use it for other altern you know, other community events and also we can, you know, possibly look at hiring it out if possible to um, third parties. Any other questions Mr Williams? Thank you Mr Williams. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? Councillor Pearl. Just on 2.6 there, I assume that's $100,000 from AFL Victoria instead of $1 million, is that right? It's $1 million and 2.6. So it looks like we've got a typo there. So 100000 came from AFL. Councillor Pearl. Yeah, thanks. I was hoping I had the mistake there. That maybe oh, it was a million dollars. Um, tell me what due diligence we've done to ensure that the clubs can have the free cash flow to sustainably pay back this money. Oh, Mr. Williams, sorry, that's now a question for the officers. So hopefully they'll answer it just as well. Through you, Madam Mayor, um, we've, we've met with the club, so we've um, we spent uh, 24 months working with this club to set up this single governance entity, so this is the first time it's been created. Um, they've shown us uh, through that uh, exercise to form um, some strong governance around how they're going to operate the kitchen. Um, part of their business model that they've shared with us is that uh, they'll collect the money as a single governance before it's distributed to any clubs, So, um, and they've highlighted to us that the and they've actually proposed, rather than an annual term, um, a monthly or quarterly uh, option to repay this loan and essentially get that money straight through the kitchen back to council. Yes, council Pearl. So that wasn't really my question. My question is what due diligence have we done to ensure that we're lending somebody money? So what due diligence have we done to ensure that they can pay it back and we're not placing them in undue financial pressure by, by lending them this money? So in a normal situation, if a bank was lending somebody a money, uh, they would be, everyone's going to come and say, oh, I can pay it back, I can pay it back. Uh, governance is one piece, but it's quite a small bit. What we need to ensure is that they have sustainable cash flow in place, whereby we're not putting them in financial stress by lending them money. The question is, what due diligence have we done to ensure that that is in place? Through Madam Mayor, um, happy to work further on uh, providing further clarity, but through a kitchen of this size and the, the size of those clubs, um, I'm comfortable that they'd be able to raise the funds that we are uh, proposing through this resolution. Thank you, Mr Trail. Any further questions, councillors? Yep, Councillor Pearl. Given the small amount of money, have we considered just giving them the, the cash? It's relatively small. We just spent many more millions of dollars building a surf lifesaving club. And given the benefit that this will provide the club, have we actually just thought of, instead of placing debt burden onto a, a club, why don't we just uh, pay the money? Have we considered that? And if it was considered, why did we not recommend it? Through you, Madam Mayor. 
We have a funding agreement that's highlighted uh, that the club would be paying this money, so the options before you we've put is essentially a, an alternate way of uh, collecting that money in accordance with our funding agreement. Um, uh, Council does have the right to consider alternate resolu resolutions if they wish. Yes, Mr CEO. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Mr Trell, can you clarify that the club requested a loan, not a grant? Is that correct? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, that's correct. The, uh, the attachment highlights that the club has requested a loan. Okay. All right, Councillor Simic, you would like to move? Okay, so we have an officer's recommendation um, and Councillor Simic would like to move that. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Gross? Councillor Simic, would you like to speak to that mo motion? Thank you, man. Thank you for coming and uh, presenting to us tonight and your ongoing relationship and work with Council. So this has been uh, a project that's been in the pipeline since we've started on Council. Um, so it's a long uh, time coming. Um, they, I acknowledge how long um, of a process it was to work with the different clubs to establish the one entity and for the clubs to be willing to do that uh, has meant that um, I feel assured that there's a good governance processes in place in order for um, a arrangement like this to be executed um, and uh, for it to be done in, in good faith. Uh, I uh, feel comfortable that um, there is a plan in place to uh, repay this money, but uh, more importantly, I think it's really important that the, um, uh, that the, the club set up uh, in a way um, that it can operate at its best capacity uh, right from the start. Um, this is such uh, an important uh, investment in our community uh, and uh, in uh, all of the different users of, of, of that uh, uh, pavilion, but um, more broadly, Jail Murphy uh, Reserve. Um, so I fully uh, endorse this um, as, as, as a really uh, proactive uh, and uh, good example of uh, how we work with our community to uh, address uh, complex uh, problems. Um, and I wish the club um, all the best uh, once it's all up and running. Thank you, Councillor Simic. Councillor Gross, would you like to speak? No? Would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Pearl? Borrower is slave to the lender, so I don't want to enslave local clubs uh, with money when I, the two priorities really should be they should be cash flowing at themselves um, from cash returns or we should give them the money. I, I don't really think that we should be enslaving uh, local clubs, albeit some might say it's a reasonably small amount, given the small amount of information I have based on the return of this money, I, I think we should just give it to them. If we are lending money to anybody out of council, uh, which should be, it, it, it shouldn't ever be required, but if we do, we should do sustainable due diligence to ensure that, that we're, if we're enslaving people with debt, that they have the ability fundamentally to be able to repay it and they understand the obligations they're getting into. Uh, albeit there's an obligation that this club might be having the way the officers have told us is it's, it's going to be paid in a different way over a longer period of time, but effectively we're lending somebody money here. So one would say if they don't have the ability to do that up front, then we should reconsider. And in this case, I think it's a worthwhile investment. It's a reasonably small investment. So I think we should just um, pay the grant out after a little bit more due diligence is done. But from three years ago, I probably wouldn't have said that because I was much more of a, a Scrooge councillor. Uh, but since now I'm older and wiser, I, I, I look at some of the projects we've done and looked at some of the value it provides and an additional amount of money of this sum into a sunk cost that we've already invested. I, I think we should keep the clubs in this instant free of debt and um, let them get on with their way. So I'm going to vote against this, but I'm not, not supporting their money. I just don't think we should be lending sporting clubs um, cash. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion, for or against? Well, I'll, I'll also um, just briefly say thank you very much for coming out tonight, um, the President, um, uh, Mr Darren Williams, and I notice also um, Annette Maloney in the audience as well. Um, it's really important that you've come tonight to speak to this. Um, this is um, a really important 
part of our municipality, not forgotten. And uh, you know, in a few weeks' time, we'll be having um, you know an incredible opportunity to celebrate the opening of the new and upgraded and better pavilion. I'd like to congratulate the committee as well um, and all the work they have done with our officers on actually, um, you know, rolling out, uh, you know, the, the new pavilion. Many of the councils have had a sneak peek through and it's quite thrilling um, to see how well it's come up. I understand the need to, on day one, have all the bells and whistles ready to go, including a, a you know a nice oven. And I know the cool room is actually already in. Um, and I also understand um, and have no doubt about this new um, entity being able to repay because I know how amazing the the clubs are at fundraising, um, having been part part of that over the years. So I have no doubt that there is any risk around um, the clubs not being able to repay this. I do share Councillor Bond's wish to be able, uh, Councillor Pearl's wish, for my apologies, um, you know, to be, a, to be able to grant that money, but um, conversations were quite frank um, earlier on um, around not, any, not having any more money going towards um, the club, and that's why you have successfully paid um, $200,000 um, along with the AFL um, in, in contributing to this. So um, I understand where the officers have come from and that that's a, this recommendation they are purely doing uh, what they know this council has asked for in the past. So um, I fully um, endorse this, council, this, this uh, officer's recommendation. I would also support um, Councillor Pearl's um, future nomination if it could be uh, relinquished. So with that, I will ask Councillor Simic to close, should you want to. Oh, Councillor Brand, do you want to speak? Yep, feel well, free. I just, yes, I just wanted to um, say to the club, I hope they don't feel too enslaved by this uh, loan, that, uh, that it is something, it was a sum of money that, you, that the clubs undertook to, to raise as part of the whole deal. And this is Council, I think, quite conveniently giving you a helping hand and um, I think it's a great, I mean, the whole thing is a, is a great setup. And uh, I, just, <laughs> I just hope the enslavement doesn't, uh, you know, sort of cripple you too badly and that, that uh, it all works very nicely. Thank you, Councillor Simic. Hey, yeah, it's a good interest rate, uh, I think. Um, so hopefully that helps. Um, I just want to, uh, in closing, just acknowledge that uh, Council has really um, already uh, contributed a really significant amount of money um, to the real development project, as has the state government, uh, as have the clubs. So uh, Council um, um, has contributed a lot, um, and this is um, uh, the next stage, um, I think, of works that uh, wasn't within that initial scope. Um, and this is why we're having the discussion tonight. So um, I, I do agree that if um, there were more money that we should, this sort of stuff that um, council should be uh, providing, but uh, unfortunately um, that hasn't been the budgetary position that we're in. So um, I thank the councillors who've spoken on this and um, hope that um, we can pass this tonight. Thank you. Then I'll put that motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Well done. See you on the uh, 22nd of March. Okay, now we'll go to item 14.1, which is the opportunity to replenish the Strategic Property Fund. And we have one person that's requested to speak to this item. Uh, Lyndon Gasking, please. Welcome. Lyndon Gasking, uh, Middle Park. Um, Welcome, please. Thank you. First Ask time in Council Chambers. First time dealing with the Council. So. Welcome. Great, thank you. Um, I'm here representing who I think are probably the most important people in, uh, in the City of Port Phillip, which are the three and four-year-olds. Uh, so I'm on the uh, committee of Middle Park Community Kindergarten and then chair the subcommittee of the Future Vision for the Middle Park Kindergarten. Um, I suppose just wanted to address for item 14.1 because 
I'm not aware of any consultation with the Middle Park Kindergarten about the sale of this property prior to seeing it tabled um, in for, for discussion in this meeting. And from what I understand, we were the last people to use it in a temporary environs, uh, per se. Uh, and being uh, chair of the Future Vision for Middle Park Kinder and three-year-olds having uh, new community funding uh, now coming through from state government and having had a waiting list for a number of years for three- and four-year-old kinder, uh, we expect that we will need to use a temporary space. Um, so the consultation process, I suppose I would I'd love to be a part of, of that. Whether this is the, the correct um, venue that's appropriate, um, you know, should we, as a subcommittee for the future vision, you know, need to relocate the three- and four-year-olds for a period? I'm not sure, so I'm not, uh, not here to sort of uh, suffer that process. But I think the other... Uh, I suppose the other key thing for me is when it comes to the financial impact, if this is something that's going to be um, sold that is used as a temporary uh, space for uh, the three and four-year-olds, um, that if we hypothecate some of the funds to actually service the community and service the three and four-year-olds rather than it just going straight to a um, strategic property reserve. Thank you, Mr Gasking. Um, some of your questions may be taken up by, by some of the councillors. You can have your seat. Take your seat, please. Okay, councillors, um, I'll now open it up to you. Councillor Baxter. Um, yeah, I guess I would uh, just like to take up uh, some of the questions that were asked. Um, so uh, about where the funds uh, would go in terms of the uh, strategic uh, reserve. And I'll also just add uh, some questions about um, whether whether this facility can continue to be used as a temporary or permanent um, place for kindergarten use. Okay, Ms. Ms McNeil. Through you, Mayor. This facility has been assessed and found to be non-compliant, so it's not actually fit for use for childcare, and it hasn't been used for that purpose for some time. So this really is a separate consideration to Council's ongoing support of childcare services. It's really about a property that's not fit for the use that it has had in the past and uh, reorganising the value of that property to be more useful for Council and the community. So by selling that property it frees up the money to be spent on other things, other property, which could be specific to childcare or it could be for other property needs. Thank you. Councillor Pearl. I asked Mr Carroll this before we came in this evening, but I'm just wondering if we can get a, a, a long-term view, five, ten years, of what the predicted balance of this reserve account will be? Or, you know, if you can't do five or ten years, what's the balance of this reserve going to look like in one or two years' time? Mr Carroll. Through you, Mayor. Um, the reserve balance is currently around $3 million. Um, we project that it would probably be around $6 million, $7 million over the next couple of years, depending on some sales. We've got some laneway sales. Potentially this property would also contribute to it. Um, we have done some broader work around opportunities in the portfolio, but um, they require council decisions specifically on each property if we are to sell. So, But I can provide some further information around opportunities and what that could look like. Um, in a separate report back. Just like to um, add a, a, a further question to Councillor Deputy Mayor um, Bax's question: um, Is the strategic property fund does it have compartments in it that you could actually um, keep some specifically for childcare? I know it may or may not be used, but you know, is there any ability to actually keep it specifically to use in, in that industry going forward? Um, to Carol? Through you, Mayor. This is more of um, a policy that we've set up in terms of ensuring that when we dispose of assets that we recycle that and put it aside for strategic property development acquisition. How that then is determined to be used as a decision for council into the future. We haven't set up sub um, buckets for instance and think that's pretty inefficient um, but the, the decision on how we use it into the future would be one that the council would make and certainly some of the things that we have discussed with council previously, you know, um, children's centre, 
could be potentially one of those kind of things into the future, but we'd wrap that up into the broader work that's happening with the children's services policy implementation. So another question from Mr Gasking was, um, they're obviously anticipating a lot more kinder children and they need more space. What, is there any advice around what they should be doing um, in terms of location, Mr Keenan? Uh, through you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, the projections for that area um, in terms of three and four year olds and birth rates is lower in that particular area than other parts of the city. And the current market is not at capacity, but it's fairly close to capacity. I'm not aware that there will be additional demand for places, rather that more long day care, kindergarten will be introduced, a three-year-old kindergarten will be introduced into a long day care setting. <clears throat> so that might result in a few individual children increasing, but currently what it will see is kids that currently are having childcare or early education in a long day care setting, having a mix of kindergarten funded by the state and topped up with long day care funded through parent fees and government funding. Councillor Pearl. Thanks very much. Is the chair and is the tree chair? Is the tree in the front yard a protected tree? Mr. Savinkov, I think that's the question. Well, for you. well, sorry, just clarify. When I say protected, is the diameter of the trunk at the level where it would be a protected tree according to um, uh, council policy, as opposed to heritage, etc. The tree at the front of the property uh, is likely to be a constraint to development off the site. So this is one of the several uh, constraints to the development which limits its potential. Thank you. Um, so just to clarify what we're doing tonight is starting a statutory process um, to uh, commence the sale um, process. Um, Mr Gasking um, was wondering whether he could feed into that with these concerns. I'm just wondering, do you have any advice around that? So the recommendation tonight is not about uh, selling a property. It's about commencing a process where we go to the community uh, formally notifying them of an intention to sell, seeking feedback and considering that feedback before we make any decision. Thank you. All right, we have an officer's recommendation, councillors. Do I have a mover for that or something different? Councillor Gross to move. Councillor Bond to second. Councillor Gross, would you like to speak to the motion? No, I'll reserve. Councillor Bond, would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Pearl. Thanks very much. I won't support this this evening. On the base, and it's a slightly strange theory, so I'll, I'll enlighten you. In that we don't have a plan to reduce that reserve. So reserves are important to council. They're, they're the equivalent of retained earnings in the business world. So as we and retained earnings are critically important, but they need to be used at a level to ensure that you. Uh, don't go into debt or don't go into too much debt and have enough in reserve to ensure that you have enough in the bank for a rainy day and also to invest in the future. The issue is if you keep your reserves at high rates without them dwindling down in the future, which it appears there's no current need to do so, um, you're effectively losing money because it's it, it, inflation's killing the money that's sitting in the reserve accounts, regardless of how much you invested or... We don't act, do active um, investment here, nor would I suggest we start that. Uh, but basically, this property has returned 9.97% in the 49 years that we've owned it, uh, versus an equity return at the same time of 10.75%. So if there's no need for the $2 million in the next five or 10 years, what I suggest we do is we sit on the block, and you might want to say you turn it to a community park, because effectively, even what's going on in the world now, I think it's a reasonable assumption you're going to return 6.5%. Therefore, in terms of value to ratepayers in the reserve account, I think it's better we hold on to the asset than, than dispose of it. Now, I understand there's asset renewals and there's costs of holding assets, etc. Uh, but even the cost of holding the asset, I think, would would return a you know three, four hundred percent more than just holding in the reserve account. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. 
Would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Gross, would you like to close? I will close. Look, all of those issues are going to be taken into account in this process that we're undertaking. Um, I accept that the return on the capital return on real estate assets in the city of Port Phillip at this moment in time of very low inflation and interest rates, uh, it would exceed that. But this will be a long, protracted process. This is an asset that um, can't be used as a child care centre, could only be used for housing if it was incredibly expensive and we didn't have a mind to the uh, highest and best use for that land. And um, I, I sense that there's still going to be um, uh, protections against... Um, the fears that some people have uh, entered in this, uh, have mentioned in this room, but this is classically an asset that we can't easily do anything useful with. So we have to have the conversation and hopefully the ultimate um, uh, decision is to sell the asset if nothing emerges as useful, viable and unique for that uh, particular property. So I happily move it. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Then I'll put that motion. All those in favour? All those against? That motion's carried. Now we'll move on to 14.2, which is the register to disclose councillor contact with developers, donors and lobbyists. We don't have any... any members of the public that have requested to speak to this item. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? If not, we have an officer's recommendation. Councillor Copsey, you would like to move? Do I have a seconder? Councillor Baxter? Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you. So, um, thank you, officers. This report fulfils um, the officer response and organisational response to a uh, notice of motion um, that council agreed uh, a few months back. And um, I'll just briefly summarise that the officers have looked at uh, some interstate examples of where such registers are um, up and running. Councillor an Copsey, um, just wondering whether we should remove 3.2 at this point in time, given um, we actually aren't giving the officers any direction right now. I'm content to that, and I'll speak to why in my comments now. Councillor Baxter, yeah. are you comfortable with that? Thank you. If we could actually do that, thank. Apologies. That's quite all right. That was in the report. So, um, essentially, that's officers' um, indication to councillors that once we've considered the content of this report, if if council would like further work done, um, we can provide further direction to officers. Um, I was really heartened to see that there is some good progress being made by councils around the country to, um, to take, undertake usually voluntary steps to provide greater transparency to communities around councillor contact with developers, donors and lobbyists. Um, the officers have done a very thorough job in looking into those and provided some really interesting um, material which I was pleased to read and I'm going to think about and I think that the rest of the councillors will also do that, uh, as well as noting some um, areas of, uh, I suppose, where um, existing examples could potentially be improved upon or um, have greater clarity uh, and potentially be adapted to our local context. So I um, am very pleased to note this report tonight if councillors uh, are of a mind to progress this and I was thinking that there may be um, potential for us to um, incorporate further work on this at a later date when um, officers are doing some further work on updating governance for example in response to um, should it pass parliament the updated local government bill. Um, so I We'll leave it at that and potentially close, but I'm pleased to receive this report tonight and um, I hope that it will inform further discussion by councillors around how we can continue to be leaders on transparency for our community, particularly on this topic. Thank you, Councillor Copsey. Deputy Mayor Tim Baxter, Mr Baxter. <laughs> 
Still working on getting my address right. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, look, uh, I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased that we're, we're, as a council, we're always looking for ways to increase our transparency. We're always looking for ways to make sure that our um, community understands uh, what it is we do, why we make the decisions we make, although sometimes they can be baffled as to some of the decisions we make, but we really try and explain why it is that we've made certain uh, decisions, what are the factors in those. Um, and. Uh, that transparency, I think, is, is is a hallmark of this council. And that's not to say that we do everything perfectly. There's always room for improvement. Uh, and I'm just glad to see that there is a culture here of looking for that improvement um, and that we've uh, we've gone and looked uh, at these different um, uh, examples. Uh, and hopefully, um, as we get, as Councillor Copsey said, as we get a bit of a better idea of the new governance environment that will come out from the new local government bill, we can then start to chart a course as to what sort of um, changes we might want to make uh, in our council uh, and how we can make sure that we are always um, ensuring that our community uh, knows the decisions that we're making uh, and why, to the best of our ability to explain it. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak for or against this motion? Councillor Pearl. I just want to congratulate the officers and council laws because I, I reckon this is our shortest motion that we've ever passed. <laughs> it's three words. So it's got to be, well, the, you know, maybe five words. I'm not really sure what the technical term is, but I, I reckon this is a record breaker. It's the, it's the smallest word count in a motion that we've seen, which is good. It's simple. Um, I fully support it. I support it on the night. I think there's been enough example, bad examples in this term of, not this term of council, but this round of councils in Victoria where we see uh, the unsatisfactory or alleged unsatisfactory effects of uh, donors' influence in councillors and what, how corrosive that can be to democracy. And anything we can do as a council to be more transparent is, is generally speaking a good thing so long as we don't impinge on people's civil liberties and their privacy. I don't really think this does that. There's a lot of complexities with rolling this out. I get that in terms of the definition of a developer as a property owner, a developer. That's difficult, but there's some advice on this paper on how to how to deal with that. Donors and lobbyists, I think, is, is reasonably straightforward. Um, but I'm happy to support it, but I hope we actually get back here before we all leave this place in um, October or... It's October, isn't it? Yep, I think so. Um, where we can put some legacy in place so 10 years from now we can look back and uh, say that we, we made this council a more transparent and open place. Happy to support it. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Anyone else like to speak? Councillor Copsey, would you like to close? Yes, I hope we'll um, discuss it again and I'll undertake to speak with officers about um, whether there is any kind of there's some suggested work plan timeframes in here, but I'll speak with officers offline after this, councillors, and see if there's any other existing work plan that we can roll this into and bring it back to councillors for further discussion. Thank you. Hope we'll support it. Thank you. Then I will now put that motion. All those in favour? All those against? That motion is carried. Now we'll move on to item 15. Item 15 is 15.1 is a notice of motion. Uh, from Councillor Baxter on the decriminalisation of sex work. And um, so we've received one request from the public to speak to this item. I'd like Miss Lisa Delimore, please, to come forward. Welcome. Please state your name and suburb. Lisa Delimore, Northcote, but a former resident of Port Phillip. I'm here from Sex Work Law Reform Victoria and as an individual with lived experience of sex work to speak in support of Councillor Baxter's motion. Our organisation, Sex Work Law Reform Victoria, is a volunteer lobby group supporting the full decriminalisation of sex work in Victoria. Until very recently, I was a sex worker and... I do still volunteer and work with sex workers in Port Phillip and unanimously sex workers support the full decriminalisation of sex work. The City of Port Phillip is an important government area when it comes to this conversation because the largest concentration of street-based sex workers is here in this area. 
The largest number of licensed brothels in Victoria is here in this area. And the second largest number of private or independent sex workers live here in Port Phillip as well. So a goodly number of the good people of Port Phillip are engaged with sex work in one respect or another. So as a former sex worker, this motion rings true to me and what our organisation is fighting for because decriminalisation is critical to ensure, ensuring the safety, equality and justice for, of, and the safety and equality and justice for sex workers. And we say that all sex workers must feel comfortable and free to report crimes against them to the police and not be inhibited from doing so for fear of being criminalised or arrested themselves. So that's why decriminalisation is so important. And we maintain that sex workers work and we maintain that there should not be a set of criminal laws controlling what consenting adults do in private. So on behalf of the vibrant and diverse sex working community of Port Phillip, I just want to thank Councillor Baxter for putting forward this motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Councillors. Thank you very much, Ms Dallymore, for coming out tonight. So before I ask Councillor Baxter to move this notice of motion, I'd like to give councillors the opportunity to ask questions of the officers in regard to this proposed notice of motion. Any question, questions, councillors? Now, Councillor Baxter, would you like to move this notice of motion? I sure would. Um, so I... Well, let's hear what his motion is, and sure. then we'll, we'll ask for a seconder, Councillor Gross. Eager Beaver over here, but um, thank you, Councillor Gross. But, um, uh, so I, Councillor Tim Baxter, give notice that I intend to move uh, this motion. Um, that Council 1 notes that the Victorian Government has launched a review into decriminalisation of sex work. There has not been a significant review of regulation regarding sex work since 1985, the year I was born. Um, there have been significant changes to the way sex work is conducted and that existing regulations have not kept pace with these changes. While the current laws allow for a minority of sex workers to work legally, the majority of sex work still remains criminalised. Criminalisation of sex work continues to pose a significant threat to the health and wellbeing of people engaged in sex work, including those who are most marginalised. Two, reaffirms Council's commitment to decriminalisation of sex work as the best means of ensuring health and safety of people engaged in sex work and of providing the best public health outcomes for the community. Three, request that officers prepare a submission to the review into decriminalisation of sex work on behalf of Council and this submission be brought to Council for endorsement. Thank you. Councillor Gross, you were keen to second. Would you like to speak to the motion, Councillor Baxter? I would. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I and thank you. Ask a technical question of an officer, or are we too late? Is it, yes, is it a clarifying question at this point, Councillor Brand? Is it a clarifying question? I think your time has passed for that answer. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. So, um, look, uh, I, um, the, the, the reason why I'm moving this motion is that uh, not too long ago I met with um, current and former sex workers um, from the um, Sex Work uh, Law Reform Victoria uh, group, but I have also um, uh, met at various times over my um, term uh, with current and former sex workers uh, who have advocated um, and uh, want to discuss the impact of the criminalisation of sex work. Um, so what we know, uh, not only from the workers themselves but from health experts, uh, is that the current criminal nature of the work that sex workers do is harmful to sex workers who live uh, and or work, work in Port Phillip, among other places, um, but certainly it's a, uh, it's a massive issue locally. Uh, as um, as the speaker uh, just before noted, um, we uh, disproportionately um, uh, host a, a number of um, uh, brothels uh, in, in this area, uh, whether licensed or otherwise, um, as well as street sex workers uh, and simply residents who engage in sex work. Um, 
So what we also know from health experts and examples of international best practice is that decriminalising their work and removing the stigma of sex work will allow sex workers to access necessary services, including health services, uh, and those of the police without fear. Um, that stigma uh, and, that, and that fear of, um, of being charged or fined uh, is a, a, a significant uh, impact on uh, people being able to access the services they need to uh, access. Um, so decriminalisation will mean that sex workers will not be afraid to report assaults, for example, um, and uh, we should be able to uh, see associated harm reduction uh, in that respect. Now, um, the City of Port Phillip uh, has a proud history in this um, area uh, and, in fact, uh, has already um, advocated for decriminalisation in the past. So this is simply restating uh, the position given the Victorian um, government review uh, so that we can make a, a submission to that effect uh, and to continue our good work uh, in harm minimisation uh, advocacy that we have been doing for a very, very long time. Um, so in conclusion, this, this work is it's the oldest profession in the world uh, and the practitioners should be given the respect and freedom that all workers uh, should enjoy uh, and that starts with making their work no longer a crime. Thank you, Councillor Gross. So, fellow councillors, I'm going to talk about three dates in 2013, 2002 and then forward to 2020. In 2013, um, Tracy Connolly, a sex worker, was murdered in the most horrific circumstances in Grieve Street. Uh, the community was absolutely shocked, both by the nature of the murder, but the way and protracted way it occurred. There was nothing good about this. Um, Tracy's death was greeted sort of commendably by the community. There were huge demonstrations about the safety and a um, memorial service was held in Greve Street with candlelights. The, com the community looked really good. But one thing it meant for me was to... Well, there were two things. First of all, street sex work can be incredibly dangerous, fatally dangerous. And secondly, on that evening, I've never been more angry in my life, in my municipal life, because politician after politician stood up, mouthed declarations of regret and cowardice in that they would not embrace the sort of difficult conversations and legislation that is needed to ensure that sex workers are both free and safe. It was a night for the mouthing of empty platitudes and I was beside myself with rage. Let's go back 2002, AGSPAG, the Attorney General's Street Prostitution Advisory Group, run by this council with the committee, uh, with the state government, chaired by Minister Dick Wynn. He wasn't a minister then. Once again, um, the argument about street sex work was that the only way you can maximise safety is to break down the ambiguity of trying to protect vulnerable people who are doing something illegal. And that ambiguity meant that the police were forever unable to effectively police for the safety of sex workers. They had to police for the safety of sex workers and the rules of prohibition. It was a clear example where prohibition led to an increase in the lack of safety. AGSPAG uh, recommended uh, tolerance zones, a form of partial uh, decriminalisation, and of course 
uh, the community affected by the proposed tolerance zones uh, were scared and angry and that led to governments withdrawing their permission to look at decriminalisation. Once again, a moment of impotence and anger for me as a municipal person. This time I was part of the, uh, the whole process. Let's for fast forward now to 2020. So 2020 is a particular opportunity for us because sex work has moved from the streets to online. And what that means is that the um, amenity impacts on residents in both the pickup zones and the servicing zones has starkly diminished. And we can have a, a long and gentle conversation about reversing some of the traffic treatments that were designed to move the, a, a, a completely useless policy that was designed to move the um, trade on. And I recommend that we have that conversation because there's no need to disrupt our streets in the way they are. So with this transition from the streets to the net, we see an increase in safety. Um, sex work is still not safe. There are still reports of assaults. But the um, way to make uh, sex work less intrusive on residents and safer for the practitioners is to allow freedom to practice that vocation and to practice it not on the street, to practice it without the problem of a prohibition and to protect residents by encouraging this transition to the net with a safe, legal way of practising. So I think that this is a virtuous time to be looking at this and the benefit for the residents is absolutely palpable and the freedom and benefit for sex workers is equally palpable. It's, you know, I commend um, the Deputy Mayor on this notice of motion and I urge us all to allow this basic freedom to practice a vocation in safety to proceed. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? Councillor Brand. Yes, I commend the motion. Um, I want to make a few observations about uh, how I think it needs to be interpreted in some detail, but um, I do remember the the times in 2002 that Councillor Gross talks about and discussing the tolerance zones with the local community was a, a fairly gruelling task. I sat in many, many living rooms of many people with community meetings in people's houses, discussing it, explaining it. What it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a big and drawn out campaign, and it was difficult. Um, I really still stand, generally speaking, with the um, with the policies that we developed back then, which are mentioned in the uh, supporting information here. When the when the uh, motion itself says we reaffirm council's commitment to decriminalisation of sex work, I stand by that too. I don't. I hope that this doesn't mean that we go directly to adopt the policy that we had 18 years ago and just go with that. It needs review. It needs updating. It needs to be critiqued and looked at again properly in the light of the current day and in, in light of the things that we've learnt since then, unintended consequences it might have, um, the completely different uh, sort of structure of, of the way the industry works at the moment. All these things need to be looked at and I hope that uh, part three of this, uh, of this motion, which is to request that officers prepare a submission, is that it is prepared, um, I think, with our basic... Uh, intention and belief in, in harm minimisation and decriminalisation in this case as a, form, as a, as a major step to harm minimisation, but to actually do a fresh, 
task, a fresh um, go at getting this right along those lines. I think there are lots of things that we can get wrong. So we have to be very careful here. But uh, assuming that, I certainly support it and, and thank Councillor Baxter for raising it. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Simic? Thank you, Councillor Baxter, for bringing this motion. And uh, I mean, I uh, completely agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, I think uh, it's imperative on us to um, put in a submission uh, into this process. And I hope that the experiences of people with lived experience um, and the voices of people uh, with lived experience can be amplified in our submission as well. Um, it, at the end of the day, we have to do what we can to ensure the health and well-being uh, of people in our municipality, but uh, also um, look at um, Victoria more broadly, um, take leadership on issues um, like this, uh, and uh, make sure that uh, violence against uh, uh, people who are sex workers um, is not in any way tolerated. Um, i just shocked hearing... Uh, and being reminded again of the accounts that uh, Councillor Gross um, talked about. So I wholeheartedly support this uh, motion. Thank Councillor Baxter for bringing it and all the words that have been said by councillors on this topic tonight already. I agree uh, wholeheartedly. Any further? Councillor Copsey. Councillor Simic just said everything I was going to say, um, but I just wanted to echo the thanks to Councillor Baxter for bringing this motion and um, that it was excellent to hear perspective of lived experience. I hope that those are elevated through um, the review and I, I would urge um, officers as they work on this submission to consider whether we can include lived experience perspectives within our council's submission as well. Thank you very much. Councillor Pearl. Thanks, Mayor. Just want to thank... Uh, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Uh, Lisa. Lisa. Thanks for coming this evening. It's quite brave, and thank you for your service to the community more generally. So, uh, you've, you, yeah, I won't say anything more about that, but just thanks for sharing your experience. It's a brave thing to do, and we appreciate you coming here this evening and sharing it with us. It opened my eyes. Um, I, I'm not an expert on this area and far from it, um, but there's two sides to the story in terms of the supply and demand side, and, and the... Um, the supply side gets a, a lot of focus in the media and not enough focus in terms of education around the demand side in terms of why people feel the, feel the need to step outside the relationships in particular and engage with these services. It, it's, it's an area, um, a sector I don't know a lot about other than hearing news reports and I, I was in the car listening to one last week which horrified me where a legal brothel owner w was charged with forcing someone to do what he described as training activities um, th this is a pretty seedy world, even in the legalised uh, legalised area, which um, you know really is not um, you know, not well covered in our society and not well focused on. So it's good that there's being focus on it. I, I don't support the motion because I don't and I don't know a lot about this area, so it's not evidence based particularly because I haven't sat and researched it. And a lot of people here, and it's good to learn from the experience of councillors have been on council for some time when this issue. Uh, was a hot button issue in the early 2000s, um, but the reason I don't support it is I, I don't agree with normalising uh, this activity in our society, uh, and a lot of you will disagree with that, and I understand your arguments against it, uh, but that's my core belief and where I stand, so I'll vote against the motion, but um, respect and understand the arguments that you've put forward to support it. Deputy Mayor, would you like to close? I would. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so I've, I've uh, had some councillors thank me, uh, but I would actually like to thank Councillor Gross, um, who uh, Councillor Gross uh, and I uh, met with um, uh, Ms Dallimore and some other uh, advocates um, uh, not too long ago, and I know that uh, Councillor Gross has been um, working on this for a while, so I wanted to make sure that I didn't finish up speaking before I had uh, acknowledged uh, Councillor Gross's role. Um, I'd also like to thank Ms Dallimore for uh, coming down and speaking to us and uh, for her advocacy. Um, I think that uh, hearing from people who they, that work in this industry and that actually know what they're talking about is um, really important when we're discussing these things. Um, it can often turn into just a bunch of uh, people 
you know, with no um, experience of, uh, of this world uh, making decisions about it. So it's really important to centre uh, those people that are most affected by these decisions. Um, I, uh, I, I acknowledge the contribution of uh, Councillor Pearl, um, who uh, talked about uh, not understanding the kind of people that that utilise these services, and um, just as an example, some of the some of the uh, people that I've spoken to, both uh, sex workers and people who um, purchase those services, um, they can often be single people who are very lonely. They um, I've uh, heard from quite a few people who have uh, disabilities who um, find that uh, sharing comfort and intimacy with people, whether sexual or not, um, is something that is difficult to get uh, and they uh, find the need to, to pay for, for that service. Um, it's not just a matter of cheating spouses. This is um, something that many, many people uh, utilise and um, I, I wouldn't want to judge anyone for um, making the decisions that they make. Um, I, uh, I also uh, just uh, wanted to, to not finish up without mentioning um, the, uh, some of the stuff that Councillor Gross mentioned around street sex work uh, in our municipality. Um, this, although uh, most, um, most, I'm not sure, but uh, quite a lot of sex work um, has moved from the street in Port Phillip to online um, from discussions with um, people like the Gatehouse, who uh, are an amazing uh, organisation uh, working with street sex workers in St Kilda. Um, their, their, their understanding, or how they've explained it to me, is that there will always be street sex work um, that for people who, um, uh, for whatever reason, are not able to uh, utilise the, the internet to, to run their business in that way. Um, street sex workers are often the most vulnerable people, people who, um, uh, through... Um, addiction issues or mental health issues uh, are simply getting by day to day uh, and are not able to run an online business but are able to stand on the street uh, and uh, make a living that way. Um, it's really important that we continue to work with these people and not just look at the, the, the online um, business. There, there are still people um, doing street sex work in, in St Kilda and we need to make sure that they're well taken care of and that's why decriminalisation is important for them too. Um, finally, I just want to uh, finish up by saying that uh, what uh, we're looking at here is advocating for full decriminalisation. I know that there are a number of different ways to interpret this, and I know that some people will advocate for partial decriminalisation, a la the Nordic model or something like that. Um, that does more harm uh, those partial uh, decriminalisation models. We should be looking at full decriminalisation so that we can um, get to harm minimisation uh, as quickly as possible uh, and that we can work with the, uh, the workers to get there. So that's all I've got to say, and I commend the motion, and I hope you all vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Then I'll now put the motion. All those in favour? All those against? That motion's carried. Do a division on that, Mayor, if that's okay. Councillor Pearl has called a division, so I'll ask you all to vote again, please. All those in favour? Councillor Copsey, Councillor Simic, Councillor Brand, Councillor Voss, Councillor Gross, Councillor Crawford, and Councillor Baxter. All those against? Councillor Pearl. Thank you. That motion's carried. Now we move to item 16, reports by councillor delegates. Councillors, do we have any reports to give? Item 17, urgent business. Do any councillors have any items of urgent business? There are none. 18, confidential matters and councillors, we have no confidential items tonight. So there being no further business, I declare the meeting closed. Good night. <laughs>